Hi, my name is Frederick Obermeyer and you are listening to Transit Lounge Radio in Berlin at Dark Havens, confronting hidden money and power. Thank you so much for joining me here, Frederick. I understand you've played quite a pivotal personal role in confronting hidden money and power and bringing this to the public's attention. I had the luck that um, the source of the Panama Papers, John Doe, uh, approached my colleague Bastian Obermeyer and me and offered us what in the end became known as the Panama Papers. It was at the beginning already amazing because we already saw in the first days we saw uh, names of prime ministers, of heads of government, of cartel members from Mexico, organized crime figures. But the data grew and grew and grew. And in the end, we ended up with more than 10 million documents. So it was obviously too much for two journalists. <laughs> so. I was going to say, how on earth do you deal with that much information? <laughs> And how do you find the stories in it as well? Well, at the beginning, we purely clicked from one document to another. And we did so like 20 hours a day. So you can imagine how happy my wife was. Of course, we realized that it's too big for two journalists. And we also saw like links to conflicts, like scandals and countries that are not that relevant for a German audience. So that's why we decided to share the data. We shared it in the end with several hundred journalists from the ICIJ, that's the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. Together, we researched it. So whenever we found something, we posted it online in a kind of encrypted, we always call it the Facebook for journalists, but it was not from Facebook. It was not collecting data um, and it was more secure. Thereby, we made huge progress in the end. Still... It took us more than a year. So you can imagine how difficult it was working on this kind of stories, for example, on the best friend of Vladimir Putin, but not being able to tell anyone. And I understand now that it's something like $7 trillion is in offshore tax havens. Yeah, I mean, this is something that I learned while researching the Panama Papers, that most of us don't even know how much money is hidden, hidden from tax authorities or basically we also must face the fact that it's not only about tax um, evasion. It's also about financing wars. For example, we found several companies of cousins of Bashar al-Assad. This is guys that are known to finance the war. And we found some of their companies. We see whole continents like Africa being plundered by corrupt elites. And how do they do it? They use opaque companies, um, structures that are very intransparent. So whenever we speak about tax havens, we speak about problems that we do see every day when you see shitty streets out here in berlin it's because people are evading um, taxes if you childcare is not cheap enough that you cannot afford it it's because of tax havens let's speak about refugees why are so many people coming um, to germany yes it is because of wars but it's also because of poverty poverty in continents like africa but these are not poor countries it's countries rich in uh, resources but it's a small elite that is basically plundering it. And that's why the majority basically doesn't have enough um, to eat in, in some countries. Though some of those countries should be really, really, really rich yeah. because they've got oil, they've got arable land, there's minerals, and there's just this infrastructure which is sucking the wealth out. I think Nicholas Jackson calls it like wealth extraction and then this sort of spider web where it's all circulating in this different economy and it's not actually going into the society that is creating the wealth. And so this is a, like a vast driver for even more inequality in the world. Sure. And it's also like sometimes people complain about Western countries paying so much development aid. First of all, it is not much. Second of all, we wouldn't need to pay anything if we would stop this illicit uh, flow of money out of Africa, for example. So I think more transparency would be a cure for so many problems and that's how it is so, and why it is so shocking that lawmakers do not really get into this uh, topic. I mean, I think it seems like the, the worldview is maybe shifting a little bit, that it was okay to do this, and that now that it's part of a public discourse and that that's something that you've also been one of the key people in bringing this to people's attention in a way that they can kind of grasp and understand the scale of it, the magnitude and the personal effects that it has on, you know, day-to-day -day life. Um, do you see that kind of shift actually making any difference in terms of regulation from governance or from banks? Yes, we. I mean, we do see lawmakers reacting. I think they do not react enough. <laughs> they do not do enough, but they do something. We also do see investigations, um, that journalistic revelations lead to investigation. That's a good thing. But in general, I think 
it is very good that we speak about it. Hey, we speak about tax evasions, about tax havens. Just imagining 10 years ago, you mentioned the, the, the phrase tax in a conversation at a party and people would run away. <laughs> you would be the freak at a party um, yes. speaking about taxes. Come on. And now you're cool and getting invited to all these wild conferences, right? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the best part of it. <laughs> and I mean, there's even a Panama Papers drink in some countries. No I drank way. a Panama Papers cocktail in London and in Munich already. So, yeah. And I understand you were also one of the winners of the Pulitzer Prize. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, that's uh, still feels strange. <laughs> uh, and if you say it like that, it's like, it still feels like, yeah, shit, that's real. Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't a dream. And it seems like it's been like a really interesting journey. Like I think because I watched the film last night, The Panama Papers, which was a fascinating insight into also how do you manage working with all these journalists in different countries and managing the security and also, of course, keeping the source safe, which is really important. And I think you made a really great point about more protection for whistleblowers and for people who are being harassed or threatened or imprisoned um, and they're being treated like the criminal for actually bringing to light this kind of injustice. The, the collaborative process I was really interested in. So uh, I think at one point in the film you sort of said, we're already working, or you're, or Bastien, we're working with a 100 journalists and, and now we need to bring more people in. But you could really see so clearly how people in different countries could easily identify, like, who are the key players in this country? Who is going to be an interesting story? So how did that sort of process evolve? It was a difficult pro uh, process, to be honest. Um, first of all, it started in our outlet, um, Süddeutsche Zeitung. Our editor-in-chief, he was a big fan of um, collaborations. So he encouraged us to share the data. So I think he's a visionary in this um, aspect. But, of course, we had also colleagues who asked as Frederick Bastian, are you stupid? You're sharing a scoop. Why should you? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I would compare it. They are sometimes in this like old lonely wolf uh, mindset. Mm -hmm. Journalist, especially investigative journalist, being the lonely wolf, not sharing anything, not even it, it is outlet. A little bit like a spy. Yeah, like a spy. Always secretive, always hunting for the scoop. Um, but I think... These times are over in journalism. In investigative journalism, it's now the pack, the power of the pack. And that's only logical because crime is not limited to one country anymore. We're speaking about transnational um, organized crime groups. So it's only logical to team up as journalists to tackle this problem, to uncover it. And I think we need more. And we do see it. We do see like a lot of collaborations currently in journalism. And that's good. The more, the merrier. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, the stories are global and uh, the, the crimes are global as well. So, yeah, the, the journalism also needs to be kind of global. How did you feel writing to Vladimir Putin? To be honest, it was very frightening. To writing, starting an email, dear Mr. Putin, is already super strange. And then seeing, I mean, he's a powerful person in world politics. He has a Secret Service um, background. He worked for the KGB. And we do see what happens to journalists in Russia. In Russia, journalists are regularly killed. And that's an ongoing threat. And I mean, there was a reason why I approached Putin. I was the Western journalist. Our colleagues in Russia, they feared repercussions. In general, in other countries, we approached individuals who are mentioned in our reporting several weeks before publication. But in Russia, our colleagues told us, if we do so three or four weeks before publication, they will close us down. We will never be able to publish, and that will be the best option. There could be happening something worse. Um, I mean, we we teamed up with colleagues from Novaya Gazeta. That's an outlet where several colleagues have already been killed in the past. And that's when this whole... I mean, before we searched in the data, and that's still kind of abstract, and then you move out and approach people, and that's the moment of truth. And that's also the moment when it becomes dangerous because that's when people can get angry. And did you ever feel, were you personally threatened or did you have any sort of, of that effect in your life? Me personally, not. I had those moments when I drove home shortly after midnight from work on my bicycle and there was cars following me, but that was my paranoia. That was not reality. <laughs> but we have seen it in many other countries. Um, well, in Malta, of course, yeah. we've seen, and, and Turkey, I think, also, and, of course, Russia, it really is a problem that journalists are not actually free to report on what's happening with people in power, with the wealthy. 
I mean, we had journalists who have been threatened. Also, our colleagues in Panama um, have been threatened. Our colleagues in Russia had to leave their country for a certain time out of security reasons. And then we have two journalists being killed, Daphne Caruana Galizia in Malta and Jan Kuczek in Slovakia. Those are journalists who have not been part of the original Panama Papers team, but they reported a lot about the fallout and they have been killed. We, of course, do not know that if there's a direct connection, but it shows you that even in the European Union, Even in those countries, journalists are at risk. And I think that is a very, very frightening development. It really is. And it kind of ups the stakes, I guess, for actually people still having to stand by, you know, deciding to tell these stories and deciding to make this information public. And so were there things that you didn't report on that you d decided it would be better not to actually share? No. Um, we gave, for example... With the journalists with whom we, we worked, we shared with them all um, documents. So we didn't do any pre-selection because we wanted to start at the same level and do not basically limit their access. Because, for example, it was not like automatically like the German journalist following the German story. It was, for example, the case of Iceland. It was the Icelandic um, journalist who had the lead, but it also, was also us and the German team, also the Swedes uh, did a lot on this part. So that was a very fruitful um, collaboration and we learned from a lot from each other. And I mean, the Icelandic prime minister actually resigned, I believe. Yes, he resigned due to the Panama Papers. And our colleague Johannes Christiansen is, depending on whom you ask in Iceland, now our hero or one who, whom you don't want to basically read on the streets because he changed history in his country. And I guess that's a, that's a polarizing thing to do. Are we still seeing ongoing effects from the information that has come out through the Panama Papers? Yes, there's, I would say, in average, there's every week one uh, story with at least some information coming from the Panama Papers being published somewhere all around the world. There's not that big... Panama Papers branding on it anymore, but we do still see these stories. And I'm sure that we will still see them in two or five years. With 10 million documents, that's a lot of stories still to tell. And it seemed like there was an interesting process of organizing the information, structuring databases, and I believe it's now available to the public. Like you were saying, you can actually search online yourself if you're interested. It is, I must say, not the original documents that are online, but you can search in the metadata that is on the web page of the ICIJ, the Offshore Leaks database. So you can search for names and you can find if they are popping up uh, in the Panama Papers or also in other leaks like the Offshore Leaks or the Paradise Papers. And that's, by the way, a way many journalists and activists found very good leads and uncovered scandals in their, their uh, home countries already. And so if you have a feeling something's doing something a little bit dodgy, that's like one way to look and check if there is some evidence or history of what they've actually been doing. Yeah, that's... A, should be a very one of the first resources whenever you look into dubious uh, company activities, in my opinion. Excellent. I'll put the links up. And is there anything else you'd like to share about this sort of experience or your personal perspective on it? Well, I don't know. Um, maybe John Doe listens to your podcast. And if he does so, I want to thank him or her, because I still know, don't know if it's a John or Jane Doe. Um, but thank you. And I think we all owe a lot to this whistleblower. Absolutely. And it takes such courage, I think, to stand up and, you know, speak truth to power. So thank you very much, John or Jane Doe, whoever you are, wherever you are, we hope you're safe. Thank you so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me.